On chapter three, we're gonna focus on the cellular level of organization. So we're going to look at cells. So here in our introduction, remember the cell is the basic living structural and functional unit of the body or even life. If we're gonna study cells solely, that's called cytology. So cyto is the cell, ology is the study of. Now cells are diverse in their structure and function. However, all cells have three main components in common. One being the plasma membrane, which is the outer region that separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. They also have a nucleus. Inside the nucleus is where you're going to find the cell's DNA. The space in between the nucleus and the plasma membrane is known as the cytoplasm. This is a fluid area that's going to contain organelles. So with these three main cellular components, we do see that the plasma membrane acts as a barrier between the internal and external environment. Its purpose is gonna be for regulation. It's gonna determine what gets to come into the cell and what gets to go out of the cell. The cytoplasm is the area between the nucleus and the plasma membrane. This contains the cytosol, which is the water with the solutes dissolved. And these are gonna cover the different organelles, which mean tiny organs that we'll talk a little bit about. We also see that there is going to be the nucleus. This is the control center and it's gonna house the chromosomes that are made out of DNA. This DNA contains our genes, which are our hereditary units. So taking a closer look at the plasma membrane, the plasma membrane has a fluid mosaic model or structure to it. All right, when we're looking at this, it's going to be a fluid sea of phospholipids, which you see here in the blue, and we're gonna see the mosaic part is going to be proteins just embedded here and there. So the lipids give it the fluidity. It gives it kind of an olive oil consistency in between the phospholipid bilayer, and the bilayer means that it has the two layers to it. The proteins and carbohydrate chains, which you see here in the orange and purple, give it the mosaic pattern. Makes it look like it's very unique with them just embedded and floating in this ocean of fats. The proteins are here in the, in the kind of orange color and the carbohydrate chains are here in purple. Now, other structural components of the plasma membrane are going to be things like the lipids. Besides just the phospholipids, you are going to find that there is cholesterol located in here. The cholesterol are the honeycomb shaped structures that are embedded in the plasma membrane. And also what we have is glycolipids. Glycolipids are when a carbohydrate is attached to a phospholipid. We also see with the proteins, there's many different types of proteins. We have what we call glycoproteins, which are going to be where a protein is going to have a carbohydrate chain attached to it. We also see integral transmembrane proteins are the proteins that go all the way across the membrane. Transmembrane means all the way across the membrane. On the other hand, peripheral um, proteins are only gonna be on one side, either the inside of the cell or the outside of the cell. They do not cross the membrane. We also see that there's cytoskeleton fibers that the proteins are gonna hold on to. These are found inside of the cell. They act as an anchor for a lot of those transmembrane proteins. So the function of the phospholipids and cholesterol are to add to that fluidity of the membrane, but they also are going to create a barrier that is selective. Only certain things can move across that lipid layer. The function of the glycolipids and glycoproteins are going to be for cell markers. This gives your cells a certain identity to them and this is called histocompatibility, histocompatibility testing. Okay, when we talk about needing a transplant of a tissue or an organ and they talk about that person being a match, this is what they're talking about. They're looking at the markers on your cells to see if your body would reject it or if it would accept it because it looks like the rest of your cells. Okay, so these are cell markers that are gonna be unique to you. There's also going to be those integral proteins. Those integral proteins function in a number of ways. They can act as a channel where they are going to just allow things to move across that membrane without having to pass through the fats. They could be carrier proteins where they're gonna actually transport them from one side to the next. We also see that they could act as a receptor where they're gonna receive information and then pass it on through the membrane. They could also act as enzymes speeding up reactions. They could be links where they link together 
um, other proteins and help anchor the cells, or they could also be used for that cell identity if they have the carbohydrates on them, those glycoproteins. So the plasma membrane's main function is gonna help in transport. It's going to help move substances um, across the membrane. Now movement of substances are going to occur between fluids. They're going to occur between the intracellular fluid inside of the cell and the extracellular fluid outside of the cell. So the intracellular fluid is the cytosol. The extracellular fluid is going to be the interstitial fluid, the fluid around the cell, the tissue fluid. Substances can move into and out of the cell three main ways. The first is through the lipid bilayer itself. It move directly across that barrier. Another is they could use a channel or carrier transporter. These are those integral proteins, so they can use kind of like a bridge to get across that lipid C. Or they can create a vesicle. This is what we call bulk transport because we're, we're moving large amounts of things at once. It's not moving really one at a time, it's taking in a large amount. This vesicle is going to be where the plasma membrane is going to actually pinch off and become a vesicle full of the substance it's bringing either into or out of the cell. Now, factors that can affect which method of transport, whether it can go straight through the membrane or if it needs a vesicle or a protein to help, is based on the concentration gradient. Molecules guys like to move from high to low. All right, they like space just like we do, so they like to move where there's a bunch of them to where there's not so many of them. We also see the smaller they are, the easier they can move across the membrane. Also, if they do not have a charge, if they're nonpolar, they have an easier time, as well as if they are hydrophobic. If they like fats, the fats will let them get through, because right? they don't like the water, they can get through those, that fat area. So if these are in any of the opposite ways, like if it's a low to high concentration, or they're large molecules, or they're ions with a charge, or if they're polar molecules and they like water, these, all, these guys all have to have help getting across the membrane. All right, so this is where they're gonna use those channel proteins or a type of bulk transport to get through. In your notes in Canvas, I have this chart in there for you that kind of talks about the two types of transport. It lists it, it kind of outlines it for you. When we look at passive transport, passive transport has no ATP required. This is like simple diffusion where molecules are gonna move from high concentration to low concentration. These are gonna be small molecules like gases, small lipid molecules, like fatty acids, steroids, and some of our vitamins that are fat soluble. Now, on this same side of passive transport where no energy is required by the cell, we do see facilitated diffusion as well. Facilitated diffusion is going to use a protein. Still no energy, but they have to use a protein to get across as a channel. These can either be gated or leaky channels, and these are gonna move a lot of times your ions, your charged particles. We also see carrier molecules can actually transport across, and these are gonna be some of your larger molecules like glucose. We also see a type of passive transport that just deals with water is going to be what we call osmosis. Osmosis is where water moves from high to low concentration through a type of channel called an aquaporin. It allows water to move through. Water, however, can also move directly through the plasma membrane. On the other side, we have active transport. Active transport requires energy from the cell. This means that we are going to end up moving molecules where they do not want to go. In active transport, we are moving molecules from low concentration to high. We're forcing them to congregate into an area that they don't want to be, because again, they want space. Something like this is going to be a sodium potassium pump. Another thing that we like to cram into cells are amino acids and glucose so that they have enough energy and enough of the products to make proteins out of. Active transport also is going to be through those vesicles, that bulk transport. If we are pulling things into the cell, this is called endocytosis. Okay, This is going to be where we're going to pull part of the plasma membrane into the cell, making a vesicle. 
This can either be receptor mediated, meaning that there's going to be those receptors, those integral proteins, and once they receive the message, it decides to bring it in. They can do this through phagocytosis, which is known as cell eating, where it's a larger amount coming in, or pinocytosis, which is going to be cell drinking, which is a little bit less. This is like the bulk phase. We're taking in lots of smaller molecules at once instead of a large molecule, like phagocytosis. Okay, so that's moving in. When exocytosis takes place, the vesicle is going to join the plasma membrane and release its contents out of the cell, thus exiting. So this is exocytosis. Now, the two basic categories of transport, of course, are going to be passive and active. Passive transport molecules move with or down their concentration gradient. No ATP is required. We see this as things like simple diffusion requiring no protein channel or a facilitated diffusion that requires a channel or carrier. And remember osmosis is specifically the movement of water from high to low. So this osmosis is going to be really important based on the relative solute concentration. This is called tonicity. So if you look here, you have A on one side of the membrane and B on the other. The dotted line is the plasma membrane. There are a lot more solutes on side B, which means there's less water. On side A, there are less solutes, which means there's more water. So if an area contains less solutes, it's called hypotonic, meaning it has more water, less solute. solute. If the solution contains more solutes and less water, it's considered hypertonic. It has more solutes present. If they're equal on both sides, it's known as isotonic. Now this is important because water is going to be moving whether there's more or less of it. So this creates a hypotonic side and a hypertonic side. And water likes to move from po to per. It likes to move where there's more water to where there's less water. So water's always going to move from the hypo side to the hyper side. So water always flows from the hypotonic to the hypertonic. The greater the difference, the faster this water will move. And this is due to what we call the osmotic pressure. If you look here, the ICF, the inside of the cell is hypertonic and the outside of the cell is hypotonic. So remember, water likes to move from po to per, so water is going to move into the cell. This causes the cell to swell, which will ultimately cause it to burst. This is called, like hemo, this is called hemolysis when we're talking about it with red blood cells. On the other hand, if the cell is in a hypertonic solution and the cell is hypo, water will leave the cell. Remember, water likes to move from po to per. If this happens, the cell will crenate. It will shrink up, and this will also cause the cell to not be functional. Okay, this is called crenation when we look at it being red blood cells. Red blood cells, it shrivels up. Okay, this is why, guys, we need our cells to be in an isotonic solution. So it's equal movement. This is why if you're severely dehydrated and you go to the ER, do they hook you up on a water bag of just H2O? No, they hook you up on what we call saline. Saline is a 0.9% sodium chlorine solution. This means it's the same as your cells, so it creates an isotonic solution. So your cells don't burst or they don't shrink based on adding more fluid to your body. So here's an overview of the tonicities. If I put a normal red blood cell into the beaker and it's equal, they're moving equally, this one is isotonic. On the other hand, if I put a red blood cell into this beaker and it actually does hemolysis, water goes into the cell and it bursts, this is going to be a hypotonic solution. You kind of think of it as hypo, the cell's going to get big. On the other hand, you have the hypertonic solution where the cell's going to crenate and shrink up. All right, so depending on what type of solution the cell's put in, it's going to respond either as not changing at all in an isotonic expanding in a hypotonic or shriveling up in a hypertonic solution. The next type of transport is the active transport. This is where you're going to see ATP actually being used. All right, so ATP is required to move the substance. 
In primary active transport, we see molecules are moved from low to high concentration. We're pushing them where they don't want to go. This also requires, besides ATP, a carrier protein. This would be something like the sodium potassium pump. So think about a pump you have to actually put energy into for the pump. So with this, we see that sodium potassium pump is going to pump three sodiums out, two potassiums in three sodiums out, two potassiums in, and it's constantly working and it's pushing all the sodiums out of the cell and all the potassiums into the cell. Secondary active transport, we're not really gonna talk, but these actually use a little different mechanism like antiporters and symporters, which you can look at in your book or investigate in other areas. Now vesicle transport or that bulk transport is where we're gonna see that we're gonna actually use vesicles to help with this. So when we have endocytosis, this is the process that brings substances into the cell. This can be either receptor mediated, which means it's highly selective. Only certain things will attach, which will allow it to bring it in. You see this a lot of times with LDL, transferrin, and different types of hormones. Phagocytosis, which is bringing in large particles like age cells, bacteria, viruses. This is known as cell eating, and your neutrophils, like your white blood cells, are really good at this. And then we have pinocytosis, which is going to bring in lots of those smaller components at once. This is the importing of smaller sub substances, and it's known as cell drinking. Exocytosis is the process that releases substances out of the cell. This could be things like neurotransmitters, enzymes, hormones, anything that the cell has made and it needs to get rid of. It needs to either send it to a different cell or it's a waste product it needs to get rid of. Okay, this is through exocytosis. So there is a concept here. There's a loss of plasma me membrane during endocytosis, but it's regained during exocytosis. And I do have a link here that if you click on it in the PowerPoint, you can watch a little video about this bulk transport. So if you take a look, here are the different pictures. Is it phagocytosis, receptor mediated, or pinocytosis? So these are all types of endocytosis. We're taking things in. This first one is receptor. You can see the little receptors. They get their signal and they pull the objects into the cell. The next one is phagocytosis. We're taking in something larger. And then pinocytosis, we're taking in a large amount of smaller particles with no receptors. All right, so now we're gonna go in and talk a little bit more about what is inside of these cells. All right, so the cytoplasm is the area between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. The cytosol is the actual fluid portion of the cytoplasm. All right, so cytoplasm is kind of more of the space. The cytosol is the fluid. Organelles are cell structures that perform specific functions. These are typically inside of a membrane, so they're normally membrane bound, and organelle means tiny organs. And then the nucleus contains the DNA. Remember this DNA is going to contain our genes, and our genes regulate what our cells are going to do. So some concepts here, cytoplasm contains cytosol, which bathes various organelles that performs specific tasks. The nucleus is the control center. This is going to be involved in mitosis where we're gonna see it splitting and creating more cells. It's also going to be important in transcription and translation, which we call protein synthesis. Be able to label cellular components and organelles by their structure and their function. This is going to actually be looked at in lab four. You can refer to figure 313 in your textbook. You can also refer to this picture in your notes. Um, there's also an organelle flowchart that's attached in Canvas that you can print off and use to help you study. But lab four is really gonna focus more on the cell structures. But make sure this should be review guys from a general biology course. So you need to review these organelles. This is the little study guide or, or help that you have in your um, canvas shell that you can print off that looks at these structures. Remember that these major structures here, um, we talked about the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm, okay, but we also have the nucleus. The nucleus is shown here in the picture. Inside the nucleus, you have the chromosomes, chromatin or in the form of DNA. There's a nucleolus, nuclear envelope, nuclear pores, and the neoplasm. That's the fluid inside of the nucleus. We then have the ribosomes. The ribosomes are these little dots that you see here. Ribosomes can either be free, just floating in the cytosol, or they can be attached to the rough ER. 
The rough ER is part of the endomembrane system. It gets its name as being rough because of the ribosomes, whereas the smooth ER does not have the ribosomes. They are connected here by sending vesicles to the Golgi apparatus or complex. These are going to modify and repackage cellular components. This is going to create things like vesicles. Some of these vesicles are like your lysosomes. You have the Golgi complex. You have lysosomes, peroxisomes, and other types of vesicles. The energy organelles are the mitochondria. The mitochondria are going to be the cytocellular respiration. They're the bean-shaped structures. This is where glucose is going to get converted into ATP. We also have the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is made up of microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. These are going to actually help give pathways for molecules and all to move through the cell, kind of like a highway system. It's also going to give the cell its shape. And then some of these microtubules can be used as centrioles and spindle fibers, which are important during cell division. They could also be used in cilia, which are extensions of the plasma membrane to help move things across it, or even flagella like we see in sperm cell so that help them actually swim. All right, so this brings us to protein synthesis. And again, this should be a review. When we look at protein synthesis, this is where we have a molecule of DNA located here. This molecule of DNA has a specific segment that we want to look at for instructions, and this is known as the gene. So you have your DNA strand, you have your gene. We want to take this DNA and we want to turn it into RNA because RNA guys can actually leave the nucleus. DNA cannot. This RNA is going to be transcribed. We're going to take the code from the DNA and copy it down into the form of RNA through what we call transcription. We're then going to take this RNA and we want to then make these, take these instructions to make a protein. This process is known as translation because we're changing it from one language to a different language. We're going from a nucleic acid to a protein, which are two different types of molecules. So we're translating it. It's like translating Spanish to English or German to French. All right, we're changing it into something different so that the cell can understand it. The cell can understand proteins better than it can RNA. Now when we look at transcription and translation, transcription takes place in the nucleus because this is where our DNA is found. Whereas translation is going to take place in the cytoplasm because that's where the ribosomes are found. Recall that ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. RNA will get translated into a protein. All right, so let's take a quick look here at transcription. Transcription does take place in the nucleus, which is in this purple region of the picture. We see that an RNA transcript has to be made from one side of the DNA. So if you look here, we have to open up the DNA so that we can see the instructions and we copy it down, creating this RNA ribbon. Enzymes are going to drive this process and make it faster, and the main enzyme is RNA polymerase. And we know it's an enzyme because it ends in ACE. There's an area on the gene that's called the promoter. This is the region where transcription will begin. It will continue to copy down the code until it reaches a terminator. The terminator is a region on the DNA where transcription will stop. If the DNA template has a T, the RNA complement that we copied is going to be an A, because remember T always pairs with A. We then, if we see a C in DNA, we will have a G in RNA, because G and C always pair together. So again, here on the DNA, G will pair with C. However, here's where the difference comes in. If the DNA has an A, it would normally pair with a T in DNA. RNA does not have a T. It instead has a U. So uracil takes the place of thymine. There's no T in RNA. There's only U in RNA. There is an editing that takes place here. Editing is going to actually use a type of enzyme called spliceosomes that are going to cut the pieces of RNA up 
and it's going to take out the introns. It's going to clip those out because they're not needed and it's going to push the exons together. Okay, and it's going to splice them together so that they will then carry the correct instructions. The exons then have the ability to exit the nucleus. Okay, the exons are going to exit and they will be expressed in a, as a protein. All right, so now let's move on to translation. Translation takes place in the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is gonna be where the RNA gets converted into a polypeptide protein. This is gonna take place at the ribosome. But in order for this to happen, we need three types of RNA to be present. The first is this red ribbon that we call the messenger RNA. This contains the codons. These codons are going to be a sequence of three nucleotides that are going to code for an amino acid. The transfer RNA is gonna contain the anticodon. These are gonna then carry the amino acids, which you see there in the purple. The ribosomal RNA is going to match these two codes together. It's going, to it's going to match the messenger RNA code to the transfer RNA code, and it's going to allow the building of a polypeptide chain, which you can see here in the picture. Here, when we're looking at the matching of the code that takes place, this is RNA to RNA. So U is going to pair with A, C is going to pay, pair with G, G is going to pair with C, and A is going to pair with U. Remember, this is RNA, so there's no T's present. Now, the first step that takes place is chain initiation. We have to initiate the process of creating this protein. And so on the code, there will be a start code called AUG. Once the ribosome reads AUG, it knows it's time to start building the protein. This building of the protein is called elongation because it's getting longer and longer as the code is being read. And then it will stop once it re reaches that termination point, which is a stop signal. All right, so I have a little kind of quiz here looking at how we would utilize transcription and translation. So we look here, we have the DNA strand, okay, it's the double helix here. We then have the RNA strand that we are going to be making. And then we have the transfer RNA. This coming together of the mRNA and the transfer RNA is gonna help us be able to put together the polypeptide chain. So if we look up here at number one, we see that we have the actual code for the messenger RNA, which is AUG, but where did it get that from DNA? Remember that A in DNA pairs with T, U would pair with A and G would pair with C. So this first one would be TAC. See so how T pairs with A, A with U, and C with G. On number two, guys, you're going to use the transfer RNA connecting to the messenger RNA. The messenger RNA here is GAG. So what would be the transfer RNA in this case? Now remember, we are using RNA, so G is still always gonna pair with C, but A is gonna pair with U. So this one is C, U, C. Here at number three, number three, we are looking for the messenger RNA. Now we can either use the DNA or the transfer RNA, okay? But if we look at the DNA, C is gonna pair with what? T is gonna pair with what? A is going to pair with what? So take a second and then figure this one out. So CTA is going to pair with GAU. So this part is looking at your rules. Remember in DNA, A pairs with T, G pairs with C. In RNA, A pairs with U, and G pairs with C. Now, to actually find the code of amino acids, we have to use the messenger RNA strand, which you see here. We will use that code to use this chart. So guys, you don't have to memorize um, the codes for each of these, just know how to use the chart. All right, so if we look at the chart, we have our first letter over here on the left side, the second letter at the top, and the third letter on the right side. And so we're going to look at this and use this. So if we look at num for the first one for A, we are going to be using the code AUG. 
Okay, because remember you were using messenger RNA, not transfer RNA. So we're gonna use the code AUG. You're gonna find A for the first letter, U for the second letter, and G for the third letter, and that's the amino acid that you would pick. And so in this case, it's going to be MET. For 4B, you're going to use CCC to find this particular amino acid. Well, that kind of makes it easy because all the letters are C. So if you'll locate the box that has CCC, you'll notice that the amino acid is PRO. Our next code we're gonna use is GAG. So use the chart over here, and which amino acid would we put down for GAG? We would put down glue. So you find G-A-G, that's our G-L-U, glue is our type of amino acid. The next one is G-U-U. So for G-U-U, this would be the amino acid, Val. G-A-U would be the amino acid, A-S-P. U-U-G would be our next one for 4F, so that amino acid would be Lu. And then UCU is our last amino acid that we can see here in this sequence, or our last code for an amino acid, and this would be SIR. Now technically, should we end here? No, because we did not reach a stop code on, but we just don't have room to continue on. All right, and so this is how it would work with the translation and transcription part. Now remember, we are creating a polypeptide chain, and so we have our amino acids as our circles or pearls, and the string is the peptide bonds. Now remember, AUG is always our start codon, which means our first amino acid will always be met. So some terms here that are important are transcriptions, the process that makes RNA from a segment of DNA. RNA polymerase is the enzyme that catalyzes or speeds up transcription. A promoter is the place on the DNA where RNA polymerase binds and we start transcription. The terminator is on the place in the DNA where transcription ends, it stops. And translation is the process that builds the polypeptide protein from RNA. DNA is the molecule that contains the unit of heredity. mRNA is the molecule that contains the codon, that's messenger RNA. tRNA is the molecule that contains the anticodon, which is the opposite and carries the specific amino acid, so this is transfer RNA, they're like a taxi cab. And then the rRNA matches the codon to the anticodon, and this is associated with the ribosome, so this is ribosomal RNA. An actual codon is a base triplet code. That's why we used three letters, AUG, CCC. Those three letters make up a codon, which is the code, and it will code for a specific amino acid. All right, you can click here in your PowerPoint when you um, pull up the PowerPoint and you can watch these little videos on gene expression. But one thing to note here with your general concepts is there's multiple transcripts of messenger RNA can be used to, as long as DNA is unzipped. So when the DNA is unzipped and open, we can make multiple copies of messenger RNA. We can copy them multiple times. mRNA transcripts can be edited in the nucleus prior to them leaving. We have to edit them before they leave and go into the cytoplasm. This is where the introns get cut out the introns get removed and the exons are gonna get are gonna get to leave the nucleus. MRNR, mRNA transcripts may be translated multiple times, meaning they can be attached to multiple ribosomes so that we can create a lot of proteins all at once. Synthesis of proteins are very fast and accurate because they are enzyme driven. Now this is the little chart in Canvas that you can print off and use as a kind of review over gene expression. We have transcription occurring in the nucleus. Transcription is going to have a promoter and a terminator, which we already talked about. We then see that it is going to have that editing process where the introns are gonna get clipped out and the exons are going to be put together. The exons are gonna leave and they are going to go on to translation. Remember that this process is going to be driven by enzymes like RNA polymerase and spliceosomes. Translation occurs in the cytoplasm. It's a process with which RNA is used to produce the polypeptide for the protein. 
We see initiation or beginning starts at the start signal, which is AUG. It gets longer through elongation until a stop signal is reached for termination. Now, guys, DNA controls our cellular activity, and it does this by dictating what products need to be made, which proteins need to be made, which parts of the DNA are going to be unzipped where, the, where we can copy down the code. It depends, and so that is how DNA controls the activity of the cell. Now, DNA replication is going to occur prior to cell division, and cell division is going to be the last little thing here in these notes that we will pretty much discuss. Now, replication of the DNA is the process of making new DNA molecules. Now, not only does the DNA control the cell's activity, but it can also replicate itself and pass this genetic information onto the next generation of cells. So this is really important. So guys, with DNA replication, this process is known as a semi-conservative model, meaning the DNA is going to split, and when it splits an old chain of DNA, is going to have a new one attached. This allows for there to be a checking of the work. The unwinding of the DNA is going to be done by a certain enzyme called DNA helicase. It's going to break the hydrogen bonds. Complementary base pairing or pairing up the bases is going to be done by an enzyme DNA polymerase. This is where a new base or a new strand is going to get paired with an old one. And remember the rules, A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C in DNA. We then see there's going to be a joining of an old and a new strand, and then proofreading is going to take place. It's going to double check its work. All right, so the reason we needed to talk about cell, the idea of DNA replication is because we have to replicate that DNA in order for cells to divide. So as cells grow and they divide into multiple cells, we need them to also copy their DNA. Now, this produces genetically identical cells from generation to generation. This is going to start with a parent cell, which has 2N in an R case. When we talk about a human cell, it means we have 46 chromosomes. 2N equals 46. This parent cell is going to grow, and then it's going to get ready to divide. When it divides, it's going to create daughter cells. These daughter cells are going to look exactly like the parent cell. All right, they're going to look exactly the same, and they are going to have the same 46 chromosomes. The purpose of this process is for growth, repair, and specialization of cells. So some terms we need to look at. Somatic cells are all the cells in your body except your germ cells. Your germ cells are going to be found in the ovaries and the testes, and they're going to be used for meiosis. Diploid cells mean that they have two two copies of each chromosome, meaning they have a full set. They got one copy from mom and one copy from dad, so they have a full set. Division of the nucleus is known as mitosis, and division of the cytoplasm is known as cytokinesis. Now, meiosis occurs in germ cells that are found in gonads, and they will create gametes. We will talk more about meiosis when we get to the reproductive chapter. Now, DNA is really important to look at here because DNA has different kind of structures to it based on which phase of mitosis it's in. And so when it is chromatin, the DNA appears very thin. It's going to be microscopically invisible. You are not going to be able to see it even with a light microscope. But a chromosome is going to be where this DNA gets condensed. It gets coiled around proteins called histones, and we actually can see it underneath the microscope. So you can see it's thicker and it's coiled up. When the DNA gets copied in DNA replication, this creates chromatids. These are replicated chromosomes. They are held together in the center here by a centromere. Guys, centromere means center part. So they're held together. Now, one chromatid is going to be connected to the other, and this is why they're called sisters, because there's two of them. Now, our cell cycle is a sequence of four main events that occurs when a cell undergoes duplication. So when a cell needs to go from one cell to two cells and divide, it's going to go through this phase or cycle. These four main events are going to be interphase. Interphase is going to have three of them with G1, S, and G2. Mitosis is the fourth main event, and it's going to have a couple of subphases that we call PMAT. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. 
Now, some cells continually will go through this cycle. They'll just keep going through the cycle their whole life. These are going to be things like your epithelial cells, like your skin. If they didn't continue to do that, eventually your skin would slough off and you'd have no more skin. Okay, embryonic stem cells do this, but cancer cells do as well. That, that's what creates tumors and problems. Some cells enter into the cell cycle only when they're needed to. They don't need to do it all the time, but when they do, they can re-enter this. This is like the liver. The liver has the ability to repair itself. Some cells, once they leave this cycle, can never return. They enter into a GO phase and they never can go back into the cell cycle. We see this with nerves and skeletal muscles. This is why nerve damage is such a big deal. If the nerve is completely damaged, it cannot regenerate, all right, because it cannot go back into the, the cell cycle. The skeletal muscles are the same way. So let's talk about these phases. So the first here is interphase. Interphase is where there's going to be a duplication of the organelles that happens in G1. This is a growing phase and it's going to work on making new organelles. We then see that there has an S phase. The S stage is also going to be where we see replication of the DNA, which we talked about previously. We then see G2 phase is going to be where the cell continues to grow and it makes more proteins. The cell is getting ready to divide. Now guys, the majority of the time the cell is in interphase. This is going to take a lot longer compared to the mitosis phase we're going to talk about. So during the S phase, we see that replication is going to take place. We are going to replicate the centromeres and the DNA gets replicated as well, creating those sister chromatids. We then go into mitosis. Again, here is a link in the PowerPoint where you can click on it and watch the phases of mitosis. But these are going to be divided into four phases as the cell is going to divide. So we saw previously in interphase that this, the chromosomes replicated. The chromatin, the thin strands of DNA, are going to condense into chromosomes. The nucleolus is going to start to disappear. The nuclear envelope is going to fragment, so the nucleus starts to go away, and the centromeres contain centrioles move to opposite poles. In this process, they are also going to have spindle fibers formed. In metaphase, the nucleus is now completely gone, and these replicated chromosomes, these sister chromatids, align at the metaphase plate, or the equator of the cell, the middle of the cell. The spindle fibers then are going to completely attach and their formation is now complete. They're going to buckle in to those sister chromatids. In anaphase, the centromere, the central part of those sister chromatids are going to break apart and the chromosomes are going to start to separate. Single chromosomes migrate to the opposite poles and we see that the cell elongates and it starts to create what we call a cleavage furrow, which is going to be where the cytoplasm starts to pinch inward for cytokinesis. So as I have a way to show this with our hands, so in prophase, we see that the DNA is going to condense into our chromosomes and see here's my cell, here's my DNA condensed. In metaphase, they line up in the middle. Okay, so metaphase, the chromosomes are in the middle anaphase they pull apart okay you can see that it looks similar there to anaphase the last phase is telophase they've pulled apart and now they're going to start to form back into a nucleus the chromosomes are going to unwind into chromatin the nucleolus will reappear the nuclear envelope rebuilds the spindle fibers disappear and then cytokinesis is almost complete where the cell is completely pinched into two all right, so if we look at this and we start with a one large cell, the chromosomes are going to replicate. We're going to see the nucleus disappear. They line up in the middle for metaphase, pull apart in anaphase, and now I've got two cells at the end of telophase. These cells, however, are smaller than what I started with because now these cells have to begin growing. Now remember here that telophase is the complete opposite of prophase. Now, Cell signaling via chemicals are going to help determine if the cell is going to do this division. This is through kinases and cyclins, and we know that kinases are enzymes. If the cell is going to live but not divide, it goes into what we call a GO phase. Other cells will grow and divide, and then some cells will actually die. This is where they undergo apoptosis, which is a type of programmed cell death. And these chemicals are going to help the cell decide which of these it needs to be in. 
Now, tumor suppressor genes and proto-oncogenes help control the cell cycle as well. When cancer does develop, these are normally the ones that are mutated. Cells that can't control the cell cycle may result in tumor growths. And we are going to omit meiosis in this particular chapter. We will come back to meiosis in anatomy 2 in the reproductive chapter. Now guys, throughout the chapter, you're going to see that there are sections over like cellular diversity. You need to read over that. You also will find that there's different places throughout the chapter where it talks about homeostatic imbalances. Um, it's kind of concentrated here on page 120, but it can be kind of anywhere through the chapter. So make sure that you spend time to read those because I could still ask questions on your exam over those topics. So this ends chapter three. If you have any questions, please let me know.